Uh, good day again, this is Professor Resnick, and today I want to uh, introduce you to the class theory of Marx, since we have now covered the uh, logic of Marxian theory, the dialectic, or what I have been calling overdetermination. And I've al already, in the first uh, couple lectures, introduced you to the overall idea of Marx, this uh, class theory. I, we want to today present the, uh, or begin to present the details of this class idea. Marx is, as I've told you, Marx's entry point, uh, the way he begins to organize um, his understanding of society, is from the perspective of, of class. And what he means by class is the organization of surplus. So that's the first idea um, in the thought concrete that he's going to uh, construct of society. He argues that human beings, la human beings labor uh, to produce wealth. That's not an original idea, that human beings uh, labor to produce wealth to sustain themselves. Um, Adam Smith had that idea, Ricardo and others as well. What Marx, however, adds to this is something entirely new in social theory. In other words, he inaugurates a whole new idea. He breaks that labor process into two parts. The first part he calls necessary labor. That is the quantum of labor required to produce goods and services, consumer goods, to sustain the laborer. Notice there's two parts here. The quantum of labor to produce the consumer goods, and the second part, to sustain the laborers. We're going to come back to that throughout the course. But in any case, the first uh, idea here is it breaking up the labor process into necessary labor. Any labor above and beyond necessary is what he calls surplus labor. So he begins to then ask questions, once he's done this, ask questions about this necessary and surplus labor. First question you're going to ask is, who produces necessary and who produces the, the, the surplus? Who gets the surplus that's being produced by those individuals who produce the necessary and uh, surplus labor? What do they do, the people who get the surplus, what do they do with the surplus that they acquire? And are there individuals in society who get shares of this surplus, even though they didn't initially get it? And why do they get a share of the surplus from the individuals who initially receive it. So we can ask all kinds of, of questions about this organization of surplus once he divides this labor process into these two parts of necessary and surplus. Class literally classifies a population into those who uh, perform and appropriate or receive this uh, surplus. So. Let me, let me, since this is so important, since this is the entry point, let me put this on the, on the blackboard, okay, this, this first idea, this thesis of Marx. So he's arguing here that people do necessary labor. Once again, the labor that is required to produce the goods and services to sustain the laborers, plus they do a surplus labor, and then the total would be the labor that they perform. Okay? That's what the new idea of Marx is, this organization of surplus. This idea that you can classify a population into those who perform necessary in surplus and those who receive the surplus without performing necessary in surplus. By the way, it's quite possible in a society to have individuals both perform necessary in surplus and receive the surplus. And it's also possible to have a society or societies in which people perform the necessary and surplus, but they don't get the surplus. This is the labor process divided into these two aspects, these two parts. Okay? The necessary labor times a productivity would be the consumption to sustain those laborers. So they perform, let's say, four days times the 
wealth produced by those four days. So we can put up here the little a is the wealth per unit necessary labor. And then that would be the consumption wealth to sustain the laborers. But they don't stop. Marx is arguing people labor above and beyond the necessary, and they do a surplus labor times the, I'm going to make the same A, productivity. And so they produce this surplus wealth above and beyond their consumption. And of course, the total then would be the wealth produced in a society. Okay? Then the question is. This part, this aspect emanating from the necessary labor times its productivity, that sustains the laborers, the goods and services to sustain the people who are doing the necessary and surplus. Then the question is, who gets this extra wealth, surplus? Who gets the extra wealth? Is it the same individuals that are producing it, or is it a different set of individuals? In capitalism, where, he spends, where Marx spends most of his time analyzing, the workers who produce this totality only get this amount, the capitalists get this amount. In communism, to make the striking contrast to capitalism, the workers produce this amount, as they do in capitalism, but in communism, the workers as a collectivity not only produce it, they get it. Okay? So there's the direct contra contrast between capitalism and communism in terms of this organization of surplus. I'm going to come back to that, but let me continue. Why would anybody produce surplus? I mean, once you introduce this, you gotta, it, it, the logic is you gotta ask the question, why would anybody produce, produce an extra above and beyond what is necessary to sustain those laborers? And Marx then theorize, theorizes, and this is in volumes two and three of his great work, Capital, that the surplus is necessary for a society to, to exist. Why? Well, this extra wealth, this surplus above and beyond necessary, provides the wherewithal for, uh, what expression can I use, for, for a social glue to exist in society, to hold the society together. Because this is going to support those individuals in society who provide the conditions of existence, remember that, that, that language that we use, that provide the conditions of existence, the non-class processes, which will enable this organization of surplus to exist and be reproduced over time. So there will be individuals in society, other than these individuals who are doing necessary and surplus, who will do a different kind of labor. Very important labor, but it's just a different kind of labor than these. That labor will produce political, economic, cultural processes, which will enable this kind of cl class process that I just described to you to exist and to be reproduced over time. So those, those other individuals, are, you might call them initially enablers. They are producing a set of non-class processes which enable the class process to exist and be reproduced over time. For example, some individual society may be producing religious ideas, political ideas. They may be producing uh, tools and equipment and so forth. So, those various non-class processes, why non-class? Because they're not directly, they're not involved directly with the production um, and appropriation of surplus. So they produce the, the, the culture of religion, the, the politics of the laws, and, and the economics of investment goods and so forth, which enable this class structure, once again, to exist and uh, be reproduced over time. So each and every society needs a surplus to support the laboring of those individuals who provide, again, the conditions of existence of that surplus. Well, the next step then would have to be that this surplus here, that has to be distributed okay, to support all these political, economic, and cultural, these non-class processes enabling the, the surplus to exist in the first place. Okay? Now, in your reading, the organization, this, this surplus, this production of surplus, and this, this is, you know, once again, after consumption, this production of the surplus and this um, appropriation of the surplus is called the fundamental class process in your reading. 
The distribution of the surplus is called the subsumed class process. Okay? And the individuals who get the surplus, called the fundamental class processes, I'm sorry, let, let me do that again. The individuals who appropriate the surplus, called the fundamental classes, then have to take that surplus and distribute it, that's called the subsumed class process. To all those other individuals, they are called subsumed classes, who provide the conditions of existence of that fundamental class process. Let me put that on the blackboard, since that's a lot of words. Erase this. We have a surplus. Okay. So this refers to the fundamental class process. A single process in which individuals, once again, do necessary labor. The yield of that is their consumption. They do labor above that surplus. That surplus is received, let's say, by, by another group. Then that surplus has to be distributed. That's the subsumed class process. That's the distribution of it. To support, I'll use a Greek letter. That's a sigma. To support all of the expenditures, the subsumed class payments, to whom? To the subsumed classes who provide the conditions of existence of this. So over here on the right-hand side, we have these individuals securing, let's call them non-class processes. So they get a cut of the surplus to help support them. They produce and disseminate non-class processes, politics, culture, economics, that is economics other than class, which provide the conditions of existence of the left-hand side. That's the logic of overdetermination. But of course, the left-hand side also supplies the condition of existence of the right-hand side. In other words, each side of the equation is both cause and effect. Each overdetermines the other. We're deploying then our, the logic we learned about the dialectic or overdetermination to understand this class theory of society. Okay. Let me give you an example of this, okay? <clears throat> Let me start with, with capitalism, our society in the United States today. So I'm going to use this I'm going to use this uh, theory we just uh, presented, this just overview to talk about then uh, capitalism. Consider the, the uh, uh, corporations in the United States, industrial corporations. Marx is claiming that the workers in, working in those corporations, they produce a, a surplus, it's called gross profit, and the surplus is received by a board of directors. Why? Well, the board of directors, literally, we're talking 20, 22 people, the board of directors in that corporation, General Electric, they personify the corporation. Under the law, the corporation is a, is a person, and the person is personified in its board of directors. And then, then politically and culturally and economically, that small set of individuals receives the profit of the uh, 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 corporation, that is the surplus that the workers have produced. So the board gets the profit, that's the fundamental class process in capitalism. Workers produce, workers don't get. Capitalism, <laughs> the board of directors get, that those are the receiving capitalists, or if you want, the appropriating capitalists. Marx calls them the industrial capitalists. What do they do with the surplus? Well, they take the surplus, and they distribute the surplus, the subsumed class process in capitalism, part of their job. They meet roughly four times, five times, whatever it is, a year. 
They get a director's fee for meeting, and then they make decisions of what to do with the surplus, and they literally distribute the surplus to whom? Well, you, know, you can figure that out. A big portion of the surplus goes to the managers of the corporation. They get what? They get budgets, okay? They get salaries, and what's their job? Well, they're to provide management. They're pr to provide the, uh, uh, the politics, the economics. Uh, the, the, let me summarize this in industrial uh, management language. They provide the uh, uh, planning, the organization, the staffing, the directing, and the control of the corporation, which will enable that corporation to exist, to be competitive, to grow, to be successful over time. That's their job, as it were. That's why they get the salaries and management, uh, salaries and, and budgets. <laughs> so they are to provide all kinds of politics and economics and culture. What's the culture here? Well, managers are to are, are part of their job, as some of the managers in the corporation, are uh, to provide a history of the corporation. Why was the corporation successful last year in a particular product that it was producing? What's going to happen next year with that particular product or other products? Well, those are various kinds of theorizations that the managers are going to produce, which you'll give to their uh, uh, managers on top of them, and blah, 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 all the way up to the board of directors of the, of the corporation, so they can theorize the success of the corporation. Same thing, managers are going to do what? They're going to, in part, oversee the left-hand side of the equation to make sure there's a surplus, so that the workers are producing and that they're efficient, blah, blah, blah. Managers also will purchase new means of production, you know, uh, equipment embodying new technology so that corporation can not only grow but be competitive with, its, with, with other corporations which are competing with it in that particular industry. So there's no question that managers provide a whole bunch of non-class processes which are crucial to the success, the survival, the growth of the corporation over time. They get a cut of the surplus. But then that's not all. A cut of the surplus is also going to get, be given to the state in the form of what? Corporate taxes. Okay. What does the state, very interesting question, what does the state provide to the board of directors? Well. Moments thought, the state also provides all kinds of non-class processes enabling the board of directors, the capitalists, to survive and prosper. Laws of private property enabling workers in capitalism to sell their labor power to whoever will buy it. Road systems, education, new kinds of research which will come, which will, you know, help Private corporations produce all kinds of new kinds of commodities, in part the computer revolution, the uh, uh, bi biological chemical revolutions that we've had in the United States and elsewhere across the, the globe. Uh, airplanes, transport, I mean, all the various ideas that the state funds in the, pro in the private and public universities and its own research labs help produce all the new kinds of, of products that the private capitalists produce and sell for profit. So the state is providing a variety of non-class processes and it's getting a cut of the surplus in the form of taxes. So it's not just you have the board of directors distributing a portion of the surplus to the managers, but also to the state to get what? The conditions of existence from the managers, the conditions of existence for the state. Keep in your mind this kind of circular flow that each side conditions the existence of the other. But we're not finished by, by you know. You can, hopefully the logic is becoming clear to you so you can begin to figure out what's on the right hand side here. Who else might be on the uh, uh, right hand side of, of this equation? Well. It's very, very difficult to build, is a joke, they're very difficult to build a corporation on a cloud. Typically corporations, if not always, are built on the ground. People own the ground. So over here you would have landlords, something that Mark spends some time with, the analysis of landlords. They get rent. So they give the board of direct directors access to privately owned land, okay? 
and then the board of directors has to distribute to them rents. So it's not just taxes to the state, not just salaries and budgets to managers, but a portion of the surplus, it could be a hefty portion, given to the owners of the land <coughs> upon which still sit the factories and offices. Okay, let me take another very important one. They're all important. Um, I'm going to uh, add it over here. A payment given to the owners of the corporations. What, what, what does that mean? Well, the board of directors, the people who sit here and receive the gross profit, do not necessarily own that corporation. Rather, in cap this begins during, in Marx's day with the growth of the joint stock companies, and it, it mat grows and matures over time till we have this kind of uh, uh, new kind of capitalism today that Marx really did not, uh, he only got a glimpse into. Engels had a much better idea after Marx died of what was happening here. That individuals through stock ownership, ownership of common stock, individuals purchase the stock, they become owners of the entire corporation. These individuals who sit in the board of directors have to give a cut of the surplus to the owners in the form of dividends in order to get access to the means of production of that corporation, which are owned by the owners, so that the board of directors can do what? Can receive the surplus. Now, this is very tricky, okay? It's very interesting. But not any more or less interesting than the others. It's just interesting in a different way. The owners also have the right of ownership. I'm sorry, have the right of voting. The ownership gives them the right to vote people on the left-hand side. So if you own a share of stock, you get a, you know, a right, right to vote. And so the board of directors, one of the conditions they have, a set, have to satisfy to stay in the left-hand side is to be elected. That's by the owners. And the owners then want a successful corporation. They want their dividends. They want them to grow and so forth. And if the corporation is successful with its particular board of directors, then the owners will continue to vote them into uh, a, a, a position in which they receive the surplus. But it's quite possible if the owners are unhappy, they could vote out uh, those individuals on the board and elect uh, a whole new board, which may include themselves. That, 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 that's also possible. There's a nuance on this which is very interesting. It's also possible that the owners may not be that interested in a dividend. Because of the tax laws in a society, it may be the case that dividends are taxed as ordinary income at a much higher rate then would be the capital gain, potential capital gain, on the stock, the common stock that the owners own. And hence, it might be the case that owners are not that interested in dividends, because if they receive the dividends from the board of directors, they pay a higher tax. They would rather have a higher price of their stock over time, because potentially they could sell their stock, pay a lower tax, and maybe sometimes even a zero tax, on their capital gain. And hence, they would be better off with a rising stock price rather than rising dividends. And that also gives the board of directors more of the surplus to distribute to managers or to landlords or whatever. That's just a nuance under the tax law, but it shows how complicated this can get. Let's just continue for a couple of others. A portion of the surplus would have to be given to merchants. Why? Because the merchants purchase the commodities of, the of the, what the corporation is producing at a wholesale price. And then merchants, okay, it's a separate independent business, they sell those commodities to you and I at retail prices. And the merchants make the difference between the retail price and the wholesale price that they pay. And that's a kind of merchant fee that the board of directors, the corporations, pay to Walmart and all the independent automobile dealers and so forth, et cetera, all the grocery stores, in order for them to sell their goods sooner than they would otherwise to those merchants. So the merchants provide an important condition of existence for the corporations, which is getting access to money from the sales of their products at a wholesale price 
um, so that reduces uh, risks to the corporations, these corporations, of having to stay in the market and worrying about if prices are going to fall. The merchants step in, purchase those goods, and then the merchant absorbs, absorbs the risk of selling at a uh, retail price, the risk being that that retail price may fall. Let me take one more. Um, there are many, many more, but let me take one more, which is very important. Watch. It's possible, it's always possible, that we have an inequality sign. Maybe the state bumps its taxes. Maybe the landlord raises its rents. Maybe merchants want, Walmart wants a higher fee for, what, for the merchanting that it's providing. Owners want, let's assume, say, a higher dividend. Managers argue for um, higher budgets and salaries for themselves. So the board of directors is under pressure from one or more of higher demands, and we have the inequality. The demands and the surplus, that's what this says, by one or more of the subsumed classes is greater than what the workers are producing in their surplus. So the board of directors has got a problem. You might even call it a crisis on its hands because the right-hand side exceeds the left-hand side. Well, there are a variety of ways whenever you have this uh, issue uh, in arithmetic to solve this problem. You can see one way to solve this, this problem is to bump the left-hand side. Okay. In other words, if the demands on the surplus exceed the surplus, get more surplus. Let's go back to our equation. It's very, very important to see this. Necessary labor. plus surplus labor, total labor that the workers are performing. Well, look, if this is increased because of the demands of the subsumed classes, and if nothing else changes, I'll bar this, if that doesn't change, then this has got to fall. That's rather dramatic because that says that the consumption of the workers are being squeezed because the capitalists, these board of directors, are trying to get more surplus out of the workers because something happened on the right-hand side of the equation. Marx is going to claim that this could engender, it's possible, it's not inevitable, a class struggle. Okay? That's one possibility. Second possibility, if one or more of these on the right-hand side increases, something, some, one other subsumed class Pressure could, could, could uh, increase in another subsumed class to get less. In other words, if the state increases its taxes and if the corporation doesn't want to <coughs> uh, 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 get into a struggle with its workers over more surplus being pumped out of those workers, then it's possible it could say to its managers, okay, you get less because the state wants more. But then you might say, my goodness, if that happens, yeah, the state gets more higher taxes, but then the managers have lower budgets, perhaps a cut in salaries, won't that jeopardize the corporation? Absolutely. That goes for any of these. Okay? That goes if you went it the other way. If the managers wanted more, then if you cut the state, then wouldn't that undercut the state's provision of conditions of existence? Absolutely. So there's no way to avoid these contradictions. There's a third possibility, okay, to go back to our inequality. Is it possible for the corporation to get a new source of revenue, okay, which would help fund, say, a, a, an investment uh, expansion or higher rents or higher tax, taxes? Yes. The corporation could borrow money. So the corporation can go out and try and you know, issue bonds and, and, and get money to cover this crisis. But if it borrows money, say to expand an accumulation or new investment and so forth in plant and equipment, it's got to repay the debt plus an interest on the debt. So we have something new on the right-hand side, which is a payment to bankers. Because bankers are a subsumed class who take their money and they lend it, one of the things they do, they lend it to industrial corporations for the debt so that corporations can help finance their uh, payments to subsumed, subsumed classes 
above and beyond that warranted by the surplus or the gross profit the corporation has received. Okay? But then you might say, well, my goodness, if I've added this to the right-hand side, the repayment of the debt and the interest, isn't it possible I have a new inequality? And the answer is yes. Yes. Because as you know, the debt has to be repaid plus interest on the debt. So yes, the debt covers this, but then over time, you got to repay the debt and the interest. And so the calculation is on this borrowing that you've done initially, that debt, will that somehow, in some way, enhance this over time now, enhance this over time, so that the new surplus that the, the board of directors receives will be high enough to repay the debt, repay the interest on the debt, cover all of its new subsumed classes. And that kind of, of uh, uh, calculation is the comparison between the interest on the debt and the productivity of the debt. And the productivity of the debt here is how it enhances the surplus over time. That's something else the Board of Directors has to consider. Now, in your reading, that's, this is complex, interesting. That's, that's a class analysis of, of, of a capitalist society. In your reading, um, you have been assigned class analyses of other kinds of societies. Marx discusses what I'm going to call the big five, capitalism, feudalism, <coughs> the ancient slave communism. He discusses a variety of others as well. But those are the ones that he spends the most uh, time with. Um, and the most time spent of those five are, are you know, obviously in capitalism. So I presented to you readings on, on yeah, if I remember correctly, readings on, on each of these. And, and you've got to bear in mind the commonalities and the differences amongst these class, these different class structures. First, very briefly, we have the surplus labor in capitalism. So surplus labor, bracket, Capitalism. That's the form in which the surplus is produced and appropriated. And that's distributed, all these different subsumed class payments, to secure its non-class structure, capitalism. We also have a surplus labor in feudalism, F denotes feudalism, distributed for all the non-class processes that exist in feudalism. The big five, ancient, slave, and let's take the last one, communism. What's the commonality here? What's, what's similar? What's similar across all these societies is that surplus labor is produced in, in, in each of them. Because, as again, you can't have a society without this social glue holding it together. And the surplus enables that social glue to, to occur by subsumed classes on the right-hand side producing the non-class processes enabling the left-hand side to exist in these respective societies. So there's a commonality, class exploitation occurs in one, two, three, four, but because the workers both collectively produce and appropriate the surplus, there's no class exploitation here, defined in the sense that the workers are receiving the surplus that the workers produce, which is not the case in the others. You can understand why Marx favored communism over these others. Just, just a footnote on that, however. On this ancient, in your, your reading, you're going to read about this. this. What the ancient is, is the same individual that produces the surplus also appropriates it. Sometimes it's called in the Marxian tradition the petty mode of, of, of production. What it really, really is is individual appropriation. So they hear the worker doesn't work for anybody and nobody works for the worker. Okay? So there is a similarity between the ancient and the communist. The worker in the ancient, the singular worker, appropriates his or her own surplus. In communism, the collectivity of the workers 
produce the surplus which the same collectivity appropriates. So I have to go back, I have to be a bit more careful here. Here there is, if you want, self-exploitation. Here there is collective exploitation. But you know, this is being cute. In the ancient, the same individual exploits him herself, whereas in communism, the collectivity of workers exploit themselves. Whereas in capitalism, feudalism, slavery, that is quite different. There the workers produce a respective surplus, but a different group, capitalists, lords, masters, appropriate the surplus received. Okay? But so there's a similarity of surplus. The forms of the surplus differ. The forms of the surplus differ because there are different non-class structures in these different societies which literally constitute, create these different forms of the surplus. So in capitalism, there's a set of laws, a set of politics, a set of culture and economics, which is different from that of, say, feudalism. And that difference shows up by having a different surplus form in capitalism than in feudalism. But in your, your, again, in your readings, you go through in, in uh, uh, some detail um, how and why these different uh, class structures uh, uh, compare to one another, um, and that, that you know that's a fascinating um, uh, analysis that Marx presents us in order to understand the similarities and differences amongst these different societies. One last comment on this: Is it possible to have a society in which more than one, perhaps even f all of the, these uh, five class structures, exist at one and the same time? Yes, yes. So one could use this class analysis to begin to reconceptualize the history of any country. For example, in the United States, um, over time, it's quite possible to have all of these class structures coexisting and then, of course, competing, contending, conflicting with one another, sometimes perhaps even going to war. So in the United States, over our history, we start out in the States, you know, uh, during colonial times, in which we have all of these class structures uh, uh, present in the States, Perhaps the most important being the ancient, the ancient farmer, uh, the ancient uh, 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 manufacturer in the urban areas, producing shoes and so forth, etc. The farmer um, owning his or her own land and producing crops. Beginning of capitalism, a wage labor system. Perhaps we also had uh, feudalism in the sense of the bond servants in Pennsylvania or in upper state New York, Maryland. Certainly slavery in the American South, and of course the American. Indian nations, some anthropologists claim, some historians claim that that was a kind of collective society in which the, the Indian tribe, the nation, both produced and appropriated the surplus as a collectivity. Well, then you can begin to do all kinds of, once you establish and argue this, all kinds of interesting uh, new histories uh, uh, for the United States in which, uh, let me just give you one of many examples. The state in the United States then would be providing Remember, the state would be on the right-hand side here. The state would be providing different conditions of existence for these different class structures to survive. So, for example, in the United States, the state would have to be providing the laws and the economics and the culture, let's say, for slavery and for capitalism. Well, that means this is weird, bizarre, but it's part of U.S. history. Part of the law would say that workers are free to sell their labor power, Part of the laws in slavery would say certain kinds of workers are not free to sell their labor power because they're slaves, they're things, they're not human beings, and hence human beings can sell their labor power, capitalism, but things can't sell their labor power, slavery. So the state is providing two different kinds of, of laws there in the same society. One law says that some people are free, uh, the, uh, other laws say that other people are not free. You can see that that's a conflict, a contradiction, that in fact in the United States, not just because of that, but other things as well, we're going to go to war over that. The state also, let's take another one. Thomas Jefferson could be a champion of the ancients. The idea here that uh, 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 the kind of democracy that we have in the United States um, was both a cause and an effect of this ancient society. Whereas, say, Alexander Hamilton could be a champion of capitalism and deeply worried about, um, unless we protect these uh, small growing uh, capitalists, um, 
they're going to be overwhelmed by the more competitive, more efficient uh, British capitalists of the day. And, and if we don't do something to help the, the, the uh, 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 capitalists, then despite we have our freedom, we just fought a war, we're free of, of, of uh, uh, colonialism, we'll end up de facto as a kind of economic colony of Britain because um, they will outcompete us. So we need for Hamilton a tariff placed on British goods which will enable the young uh, industrial capitalists in the United States to grow. So the state is to provide a new condition of existence. We'll get a tax for doing that, new condition of existence, which would be a tariff. Ham uh, Jefferson comes back and says, no, no, that tariff is going to discriminate against these ancient farmers because they're going to have to pay higher prices for their tools and equipment than they would otherwise. And so in order to have a strong, thriving ancient, we don't want a tariff. Hamilton says, we need a tariff. You can see what's going to happen here. You can have a struggle in this state over this particular uh, political process of, of a tariff. And we can reproduce this again and again um, in, throughout U.S. history. So in your reading, in your syllabus, you're assigned um, some very interesting uh, readings on these different class structures. Please read them. Understand how each functions and how it, that functioning of each is different from the others. The next time around then, we're going to uh, make use of this class analysis to begin to understand Marx's greatest work, Capital. <laughs>